Hello everyone and welcome to CRAMSurge, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic. We review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinion and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perrin. And together with Professor Sababala Subramanian and Maria Digby, we bring you Crumb Search from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, today we'll have a look at a paper examining data from the European Ernie Society Open Abdomen Registry, particularly looking at the role of a visceral protective layer in the management of open abdomen. We will not have a teaching session today, so a slightly shorter episode today, uh, but we'll make up next time. I'll leave you to it. Hello, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to present the review of the paper. We have here Joe with me for presenting as well. So the presentation is on the paper we studied the use of a visceral protective layer that prevents the fistula development in open abdomen therapy. These results are from the European Hernia Society Open Abdomen Registry, and it was published in the BJS in 2023. And here's a link for the short report as well. Uh, I would like Gio to start with the background. Over to you, Gio. Wonderful. Um, so just a few words about uh, really just what we're talking about. Um, when we're talking about a visceral protection layer, we're talking about uh, an additional layer of protection that gets placed in between the viscera, so the bowel, uh, and whatever uh, device or technique or dressing that is then used to uh, aid in the management of an open abdomen case. So a case where, for whatever reason, um, it is not possible to um, provide full closure of the abdomen by just opposing the two fascia margins. And uh, this is a picture taken from the paper you can see mentioned at the bottom end. Um, number one obviously represents the abdomen itself or the bowel sits. Number two is the visceral protection layer. It is normally purely and simply a plastic sheath. Um, and this plastic sheath sits then below a variety of other layers. And most commonly what you will see nowadays is that on top of that, there will be a, a device of some description uh, that will aid gradual fascial closure. Now, most commonly, this is simply a mesh that can be a vicral mesh or even a proline mesh that uh, gets anchored like a bridge between the two edges of the fascia. And gradually, in various sessions of, of theaters and various treatment sessions, that mesh gets trimmed smaller and smaller and smaller to provide more and more tension to the edges of the fascia, providing just a position. And the trick is to just get the right amount off and make the, the mesh smaller enough to provide traction without causing necrosis and she's wiring. Um, on top of that, normally there's some uh, vac foam and a, a vacuum therapy device is applied as you um, can see. Now, there's loads of variation of uh, the way this can be done, but this is kind of a general, general diagram of how most of these cases look like. And the objective of this paper sits really in, in identifying the role of the visceral protection layer compared to just not using it and just putting a mesh and a back on top of it. So I'll give the ball back to Arani for uh, um, a pick up. Thanks, Rio. And so the study included the patients with the open abdomen from the EHS registry, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, and what were they looking at? What, what did they do to them? So they had intervention, which they used a visceral protective layer and with whom they compared with, with patient population who did not receive the visceral protective layer. And this study looked at the outcome of reduction in the incidence of the intra-atmospheric fistula with the use of the visceral protective layer, in addition and also with uh, negative pressure wound therapy and dynamic closure therapy. And Geo would speak about methods. Over to you, Geo. Wonderful. So the authors describe in their own words this as a propensity score match case control study uh, with a one-to-one -one treatment to control caliper width, uh, not point two allocations. Now, um, Arani, will, will you remind me what a case control study is and the, what the authors actually do in this case? Yeah, uh, sure, sure. So usually what a case control study is, uh, it looks at the exposure with the outcome as a starting point, 
while this is has already um, have the exposure, but we are looking at the outcome. Uh, so it basically means a cohort study. Yeah, I agree with you. I think this is more of a cohort study and case control here is a little bit of a misnomer. And perhaps this is, a, this is a cohort study with a propensity score matching technique. Uh, obviously, the authors here, as you as you correctly mentioned, start by looking at the exposure, a GD open abdomen, and then follow patients up. Uh, they don't look at the outcome, which is uh, enteroatmospheric fistula, and then match them with someone that didn't have it, and then look back at the exposure. Um, so I think there is a misnomer here. Um, in any case, um, Patients are included, as Rani mentioned, are from the EHS Open Abdomen Registry. Now, this is a dedicated uh, registry for open abdomen cases that was designed originally and opened in 2015 and carried on up to um, 4th of December 2022 uh, for the purposes of this report. Obviously, recruitment is still uh, ongoing. It includes only uh, adult patients, um, and uh, it does include patients from uh, a variety of countries, not just the UK. Uh, the authors run their analysis uh, basically by, via two main stems. One is propensity score matching, as we mentioned, and the other one is logistic regression analysis. So um, they run a logistic regression model to identify whether the visceral protective layer actually works in um, correcting for all the other variables that we will uh, we will chat about. The outcomes they look at, as Arani mentioned, entrotomostatic fissure development is the main one. Obviously, this is a cohort study, so primary outcome per se is not really primary. So there are other outcomes that they look at, uh, entrotomostatic fistula uh, in presence of a failed fascia closure, uh, and time to fistula development, as well as time to um, uh, discharge, as well as deaths, a variety of other outcomes that we will have a glance at as we go along with the results. Um, reading through the METSA session, um, I did um, ask myself a few questions about the um, propensity score matching model. Now, the um, authors do mention a few things about um, the propensity score matching itself, and they say that uh, the model is based on both um, clinical relevance and descriptive statistics uh, variables. Um, I'm not entirely sure how to interpret this. The authors actually do provide some sort of list of um, variables, and I will give you a brief overview of that. Um, so they say, to be more accurate, um, malignant disease, arterial hypertension, renal disease, hemodialysis, pulmonary disease, evidence of risk factors for a complicated course, open abdomen therapy as initial surgical procedure, number of previous operation, duration of open abdomen therapy, and attainment of fascial closure. Now, obviously, uh, as you probably heard, some of these variables are fairly categorical and, and easy to kind of pin down, like either you are on dialysis or not. Some of them are a little bit well, less well-defined, such as pulmonary disease. What does that mean? Asthma, COPD, how severe? And some of them are really poorly defined, such as risk factors for a complicated course. And I couldn't really work out in any of the appendixes what those variables were. So I, I was left a little bit unsatisfied by this. Anyway, we'll talk about it as we go along. So um, ball back to you, Rani, um, for some results. Beautiful. So uh, this table is quite crowded. However, we're just going to focus on the important aspects of it. So to start with, they had uh, 1,009 patients but on comparing the unmatched population as well as the matched population, there's quite significant drop, a reduction of about 60% of the study population. Interestingly, making it more obvious, uh, the propensity score matched population but completely excluded when they are considered the open abdomen therapy as the initial surgical procedure. So, it, it it also says the indication for the abdomen therapy, uh, open abdomen, which are like peritonitis, burst abdomen, trauma, but among them, peritonitis was the commonest indication for inclusion in this registry. So looking at the interventions that they have given, uh, offered both VAC and dynamic closure techniques uh, with significant statistical difference, suggest that both the cohorts are completely different. Uh, the other aspects of, you can see that, uh, as Joe mentioned earlier, the secondary outcomes of uh, number of dressing change, duration of the open abdomen therapy, the duration of staying in the hospital, mortality rate, they didn't 
show much significant difference, like statistically significant difference. However, it did show some difference in the primary outcome, which we were looking at. There is a significant difference, statistical difference in the incidence of the intra-atmospheric fistula, where Gio is going to speak about more. Over to you, Gio. Fantastic. Overall, in the um, include the patients, they recorded 71 intra-atmospheric fistulae, uh, so about 7% overall. And as you can see, the split between the two groups, these are data from the matched cohorts, is quite different. It's 6.1 versus 16.3%, so uh, roughly um, a, a threefold difference. Now, as Arani mentioned, uh, we did feel reading through the paper that the two cohorts, despite propensity score matching, were, were quite heterogeneous. Um, the authors highlight how um, um, even in presence of a failure of fascia closure, um, the visceral protective layers still seem to provide a degree of protection against the development of an enteroatmospheric fistula. Now, again, um, this is a much smaller group of patients, so it is hard to say how significant that finding is. Um, if I have to look at the overall methodology, I would say that probably um, the logistic regression model um, that they uh, employed to then look at the role of uh, VPL um, in correcting for all the other variables um, is probably even more solid than the result from the propensity score matching analysis. And uh, they do demonstrate uh, an odds ratio of 0.36 with a statistically significant result. As you can see, the range is all below one uh, in favor of VPL um, in terms of prevention of uh, intra-atmospheric fistula, with all the caveats that uh, we just discussed. And uh, Arani, do you want to go through this um, uh, chart quickly? Sure, sure. So as Jim mentioned earlier, the, the, what was the outcome of this uh, study? So this bar chart shows the outcome of the study showing that there is a significant increase in the incidence of intra-atmospheric fistula in patients without the visceral protective layer treatment in both the cases and matched and propensity score matched populations. So over to the next slide, uh, we're going to see the limitations of the study. So I wouldn't say it as a self-reported limitation. However, they have stated that open abdomen therapy was based on a structured approach in 369 patients and the rest were at the surgeon's individual discretion. Jill will explain this further about yeah, yeah, I mean, th there's not an awful lot to explain, unfortunately, meaning that um, um, we couldn't really, the, the authors do not provide a definition of what structured or non-structured approach is. And having discussed with a few colleagues and interrogated a few experts and also have been through a couple of guidelines, I couldn't really find a clear cut definition of structured or unstructured approach. Uh, I don't know if anybody in the audience with more experience than me or, or, or someone that has come across this concept of structured approach um, does, could, could provide a definition, but certainly the authors do not do that, which I think is an issue. Um, obviously, as we discussed, we don't think this is a case control study. Um, the propensity score matching um, is not very clear to me what variables were included and um, to... Um, what degree they were relevant or irrelevant. And um, there's a 60% drop off uh, between unmatched and matched um, cohorts. And to me, that, that suggests that the propensity score matching is generated a significant degree of selection bias, which is corroborated by the fact that all open abdomen um, as initial surgical procedure were removed from the propensity score matching. Um, certainly, the cohorts are heterogeneous. We mentioned that. Um, I think if I have to look at this paper, not just as it is, but also as part of a discourse on the visceral protective layer, you can kind of see how there was already is a declaring itself novelty effect. The previous study that was published in Annals of Surgery uh, three years ago um, that included a much smaller number of patients, about 100, demonstrated a tenfold improvement in terms of visceral rate in favor of the visceral protective layer. Now, this study, which is bigger and you'd argue has got a slightly more rigorous methodology, although the methods are very similar, um, does demonstrate a threefold uh, benefit. So 
the effect size is decreasing. And I can probably guess that the next few studies that we're going to see with bigger groups of patients, that effect is possibly going to be even more diluted. But again, that is a guess. But, you know, everything needs to be looked at in context. Um, one very important thing that I felt was missing as a clinician is the clinical relevance of the fistula that these patients developed. Certainly, um, you know, if you look at the overall natural history of enterocutaneous fistula, um, the moment certain elements are corrected, such as the unwellness of the patient, nutrition, and generally speaking, infection, a lot of them will cure themselves, will heal themselves. Um, there are some factors that can be looked at to determine how likely they are to resolve themselves. Obviously, none of this data is presented here, but you could say roughly 50% of enterocutaneous fistula that occur as a result of post-surgical in insult actually will resolve themselves within six months. Um, we don't really know how many of these fistulae that they recorded uh, persisted and how many of them were significant for the patients. So, uh, ball back to Arani um, for um, some wrapping up. Thank you, Joe. So, in conclusion, this study suggests that wizard protective layer should be considered in open abdomen therapy. So if this is incorporated into a standardized treatment approach and in conjunction with negative pressure wound therapy and dynamic closure techniques, as I said before, the time taken for the open abdomen therapy is reduced and the likelihood of complications, especially the intra-atmospheric fistula that we were looking at as a primary outcome, would also be reduced, can also be reduced. So the table below shows, basically summarizes the points that we have discussed earlier. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you. As we discussed, um... A few uh, points after the presentation, I'm uh, giving you now a brief summary. The main concern that we have regarding this paper really relates to the um, comparison between the two cohorts, visceral protective layer versus no visceral protective layer. And we highlighted some of the limitations associated with the propensity score matching methods and particularly the fact that it does introduce the selection bias. It is, however, still a very good technique to create two comparable groups when randomization is not possible, like in this case. We feel that despite the use of propensity score matching, however, uh, the heterogeneity between the two groups is quite significant. Um, if you think about it, um, a variety of traction mediated techniques are available out there. Um, some of them don't, don't necessarily require a visceral protective layer, but pretty much all the mesh mediated traction techniques would normally require some form of visceral protective layer, maybe not necessarily a licensed one, um, but some protection would normally be applied. It is unclear where patients where a non-licensed visceral protective layer was used were actually placed in the registry and therefore in, in which cohort they would ultimately be analysed. A further very important point relates to the message that can be extrapolated from this paper. Now, the use of a visceral protective layer uh, appears to be uh, quite intuitive uh, as an intervention when adopting mesh-mediated, traction-mediated fascia closure. It would seem then rather counterintuitive not to use it in that context. Uh, would the data in this paper make us change our practice? Not necessarily. Um, we discussed the fact that ultimately the technique that you are going to use to try and achieve fascial closure in these patients um, and the choice of not achieving fascial closure, which is sometimes something that we do and rather manage the patient as a controlled ventral hernia that can be repaired at a later stage really relates to the patient condition and their physiology. Therefore, this data does not really affect our choice of using or not using a visceral protective layer. When we're using traction mediated fascia closure, particularly with a mesh, we would use a VPL. When we choose to handle the patient, with a different technique, such as 
putting um, a dissolvable mesh and using a vac on top, uh, there would be a different story. And this plays again um, predominantly uh, with the concept of um, heterogeneity between uh, the two compared cohorts. Different thought process, different techniques are adopted for different patients depending on their baseline condition and the likelihood of achieving a fascial closure um, at the end. That's it for us. See you next time. Thank you everyone for tuning in and listening. Until next time, keep running your life with our surgical podcast.